there was nothing in Skinner's verbal behavior that could be uh, uh, salvaged, as far as I could tell. It's, it, it was, uh, if you took the terms he used literally, it just didn't make any sense. And uh, with regard to language, as far as I could see, it was not dealing with the most elementary properties. My own feeling is that uh, in the longer term, the concept of learning is going to essentially disappear, be recognized to be not a proper category of uh, development and autogeny. Again, it, it, it satisfies me because it's a way of bringing these things in which people have been opposed to each other and showing that we can have a common way of, of thinking and talking about them. I somehow feel that, I, do, should we keep on going? Or I, I somehow feel there are so many questions we could still talk about. Can we reschedule to continue sometime? To enforce a certain concept of what power doesn't this association has always been very good to me. I went to my first meeting in 1932. Uh, the existence of the continued question about uh, whether or not... Good evening, everyone. Today, I'll be the one speaking. I'm honored to be the one introducing the second part of this very special encounter. First of all, we are grateful to you for coming here again, and we appreciate the tone of mutual mutual respect both of you showed last time. And just as a refresher for everyone, since it's been a few weeks since you last met each other in the first part of the talk, uh, and we understand that you both are generally very busy, we thought it would be a good idea to quickly go over uh, some of the general topics that you discussed last time. Um, you talked about K.S. Lashley's serial order and behavior as related to chaining in chaining in language and sequential behavior. You also, also mentioned some uh, experiments done by George Miller on language. You also went over uh, briefly on Skinner's verbal behavior and its proposal for language. Uh, you mentioned uh, people such as Timberg, Lawrence, and Thorpe. Uh, you also talked about instinctual drift uh, related to misbehaviors of misbehavior of organisms uh, by Keller and Nancy Breland. You also mentioned uh, Dave Bremark. Uh, you also talked about behavior reinterpreted as information provision. That was very brief. Uh, also about the useful usefulness and sense of the very concept of learning. Uh, regarding issues of definition and demarcation, uh, growth, uh, if, 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 either, if it, it was either growth or development or both, or a continuous continuum, sorry, changes in the organism in its ontogeny, ontogeny and such, uh, also selection versus association as mechanisms for behavior. Uh, you also mentioned paradigmatic learning, uh, the issue also of poverty of stimulus, uh, the need or not for negative examples and made some anal analogies with vision. Mm, you also talked about the proposal for uh, the existence of innate structures or not. Uh, you discussed if, if there were inherited mechanisms and or learned mechanisms, uh, for example, in phonology you mentioned. Uh, and also you touched on the topic of evolution and emergence of language. Uh, related also to function and structure of language and its relationship with evol evolutionary processes, also with genetics and environmental influence. And you close the talk with the possibility, discussing the possibility of intelligence and language being uh, maybe a deadly mutation. So that said, a very short list. We're, you know, we are fairly limited of, on time, as, and as you may already know. Uh, we have a, uh, about an hour from now. And as I said before, we appreciate the more relaxed and conversational tone of the last conversation you talk, you, you had. But uh, this time we kindly ask you to keep in mind that, the limits on time, and maybe be as concise as possible and focus on the issues you deem most important for this encounter on language. On our part, 
uh, we will let you speak. You're free, of course, to ask each other whatever you want, as long as it is on topic and or or not. Maybe that's on you. <laughs> and of course, you can also go back to topics you think uh, th if you think they should be addressed again. Uh, that is all on our part. And you have the floor. You can start. Yeah. Would you like to begin, Noam, or would you like me to start with some comments? As you wish. <laughs> um, okay, I guess what I find uh, fascinating about this list is um, the places where I see we have uh, areas of agreement. I mean, well, when I see something like uh, the appeal to um, innate things um i see that as not an issue and not a not a problem that uh, of course what uh, we humans do depends upon our anatomy and all sorts of things certainly the the whole um uh, articulatory apparatus uh, that allows us to speak is a function of uh, genetic histories and and so on and and in fact uh, the, the uh, I would like to come back, though, to the question of whether some of the things that appear in a historical perspective to be in opposition really are uh, differences in the in whether we're looking at, uh, first of all, whether we're looking at function or looking at structure. But another part of it uh, is that the, the behavioral approach tends to look first to the environment and then work its way in. Whereas uh, 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 Noam, you were speaking, for example, of the uh, the recursive core that that is the the fundamentals of language as being something that's uh, that that's the source of what we're able to do, and and I think uh, even if uh, uh, all of that was there, that's fine, except that it doesn't say much about what people are going to talk about and when they're going to speak and and the things they they speak about. And I see then the possibility of uh, an account of those functional things, the things that the environment determines. Um, and uh, I don't see necessarily an incompatibility between those functional things and the things that we can say about what the constraints might be on the structure of a language and so forth. So I wonder if you might want to come pick up from there and, and we can we can see where it goes. Well, we we certainly have to make a distinction between the nature of language or any other cognitive system and the way it's used. Uh, that distinction goes back to classical Greece. It's a distinction between what Aristotle called possession of knowledge and use of knowledge. So if we're talking about there is a, a research project which seeks to discover the nature of language, uh, the way it evolved, the uh, its structure, its uh, components, how it's acquired, and so on. That's all about the nature of language. Well, there's another uh, endeavor which asks, uh, how do people use this? What do they decide what, what to say uh, about that? There's almost nothing to say. There's no account whatsoever that deals with what you and I are doing right now. Basically none or any other casual conversation, uh, too many things are involved. These are um, way too many variables are involved for anything coherent to be said. And in fact, we know nothing about it. There's nothing to be said about conversations. I mean, you can do statistical analysis and show that after this word, some other word, is more likely to appear than another one is. That's, in fact, the basis of the deep learning work. But that is so superficial and trivial that it's hardly worth talking about. Uh, the fact is, even take my dogs, you try to give an account of what they're going to do next, uh, you, know, you can kind of make some guesses. They have a pretty limited repertoire. <laughs> 
but basically you can say nothing of any interest. And what does enter into what they do is the usual combination of what enters into growth and development. There are three factors that you can't get away from in determining what my dog will do next or what I will say next. One factor is the internal structure of the organism. What kind of a structure does it have? That's one factor. In the case of learning, that begins with innate structure. Second factor is whatever the environmental circumstances are. Third factor is just laws of nature. How do things function in general? Uh, and then you can look at the mixture of these factors. Now, in the, in the case of the first of these studies, the study of the nature, evolution, acquisition of language, I think there's a fair number of results. In the second area, how language is put to use, there's some generalizations, but there's basically nothing in the way of science. I'd argue that it's more than it's too more complicated. Than uh, yeah, of course it's complicated. Uh, in fact, one of the things that's essential for us to recognize in talking about uh, uh, language in particular is multiple causation, is that any particular bit of behavior, um, anything we do is simultaneously impacted by a whole variety of things. Multiple things in the environment, as well as multiple things having to do with physiology and history and genetics and so forth. Um, even somebody walking into a um, uh, a fast food restaurant, but these days they don't do it as much because of COVID, but um, will be influenced by what other people are saying and the signs that are up and the smells that are there and the time of day it is. And each of these things separately will determine maybe what this person is going to say and order in a particular instance. But, you know, we, we can't identify the details of particular uh, uh, physical things that happen all the time. So, for example, if, if we were watching a leaf that had just fell off a tree and it drifted across the street and fell down at somebody's feet, um, and uh, somebody who is a specialist in, in uh, aeronautical engineering were to say, uh, were to be asked about why the leaf turned at a particular point in its descent, he could make guesses. He or she could make guesses about uh, which way the wind was blowing and the surface of the leaf and all. And even if that person's account of that falling leaf was unsatisfactory, we wouldn't necessarily say, well, gee, you're lousy in your discipline because you can't say anything, but there might still be underlying principles. The things I can I can have seen that are manipulable things in the laboratory, and they are just little pieces. I think they're the beginnings. I, I, I agree with you that we don't know a lot, that we've got plenty that we've yet got to, to study and to understand. But I do know that um, I can change the content of a conversation by differentially responding to what the other person says. And I think that's terribly important to know about because I think that happens in politics all the time. I think that's part of the evils that go on in, in contemporary things. And so, so one speaker can determine what another speaker says. And in fact, if I've sat at uh, social events where you, you see conversations going around the table and you can see how somebody starts to speak and suddenly some people turn their heads and are now interacting and that person then increases the talk about certain kinds of things. So there are things in the dynamics that are studied, not just by behavioral folks like me, but sociologists are studying networks of communication and I think there are some regularities there that we're beginning to discover things about. So I'm, I'm a little bit more hopeful that, that yes, I admit there's a lot to be done. I think, uh, yeah. I think. No problem with that. We can say lots of things, just common sense about how uh, behavior takes place, how it's influenced by circumstances, uh, how I would react to what somebody says and so on. And if any of that can be made more precise and some principles can be discovered, there's anything to learn about it, be delighted. Uh, can't see why there can be any question about that. Personally, I'm skeptical because I think it's a too many variable problem. It is the leaf example that you used is actually a good one. Uh, no matter how much physicists and 
aeronautical engineers are going to learn. They're never going to be able to see very much of interest about leaves blowing in the wind. Just too many things involved. If you can say something, and if it's an interesting topic, all to the good, who could object? My interests happen to lie elsewhere, but that's not a matter of debate and discussion. It's like saying one person is interested in chemistry and other interested in biology. Nothing to debate about. Okay. Well, well, maybe, maybe then we ought to turn to a couple of other things because there were there are quite a few things in that list and then there are quite a few things we never got around to talking about um i um i'd be particularly interested in in hearing a little bit more um um uh, of other kinds of things that uh that have involved you and skinner and and that history uh of course i know about the 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 language uh uh review uh but I also uh, know about the review of Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which I think uh, fewer people recognize or know about these days. Um, I, and given that uh, that I, I I did work there at, in Cambridge, and and although I uh, and I I was familiar with Skinner's work, I was surprised at how critical of his views. Uh, that review was given that i suspect that you and he would probably have agreed on certain political things about um totalitarian uh, control versus other kinds of control and and um well i might i might as well give you an anecdote when uh when our older son was uh going to high school he came home with a packet from social studies one day and it was the packet on fascism and the content of that packet was some discussions of Skinner and his Walden II. And I found that the, the jump from Walden II, which Skinner had written as this hopeful novel at the end of World War II, which is really just proposing that we should not look at culture as, as kind of just given to us, but as culture as uh, something in which we could experiment with different kinds of practices. Um, I wonder why. What led you to to come out with such a strong reaction to that particular book, and and uh, that led to the review in the New York Review of Books. Uh, the, the you're talking now about the review of Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Yes. Yes. Well, I thought that book was pure totalitarianism. It was about how to control and manipulate people by some master controller who somehow knew all the answers and was trying to organize and shape behavior in their interest. Of course, the science was zero. There was no, no nothing said about any scientific results about manipulation and control. There aren't any, but uh, the idea that that's a utopia that seemed to me the ultimate dystopia but uh, i think that's consistent with skinner's views he was we were actually so. quite friendly personally but that, he was a deep like reactionary and uh, his idea that we could control manipulate and shape behavior and we should do it is to me just anathema straight out of solonism I I think that I feel almost like I've read a different book. So let me let me try my my reactions to it. Uh, first, is there's, there's a very substantial part of it in which he extols uh, the literature of freedom and talks about the role that uh, early documents uh, had in uh, in producing uh, freedoms and resisting uh, uh, controlling regimes. And the other part of it is. Um, and and I understand that that you don't feel that many of the things we we've learned about uh, contingencies are are well enough defined that we could we can do much in the way of control. But I've always felt that if we see that some things are going on in the world, uh, then we we best find out as much as we can about them. And he wants people to wanted people to take this view that. Um, advertisers are controlling our behavior educators are controlling our behavior politicians are controlling our behavior 
and that we would understand how some of that works. Now, you might say that he hasn't come up with a good way of doing that yet, but it, it seems that uh, I, I never had the feeling that the that there was going to be a, a controller or even a group of controllers, that the idea was uh, a thoroughly educated population who knew more about how some things in behavior worked would have a better defense against these kinds of abuses. My view of the, the contemporary politics is I see these things where politicians are shaping with each other's say, and you can see contingencies that lead some of them to lie a lot. And the lying has nothing to do with the way the world is, but have to do with what things you get when you say certain things. And that means that the things that people say are shaped up by the consequences they have. And it, and sure, we are just scraping the surface and beginning to do a few of these things, but 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 shouldn't we urge people to learn more about these kinds of things and be aware of them? Uh, Absolutely. Than I've myself written reams about this manufacturing consent, control of behavior, the way advertising yeah. works, the way the political system works. Uh, I think we should definitely learn a great deal about that. And I've, as I say, devoted plenty of my own time and energy to it. I didn't actually find anything in Skinner that contributed to this. What I saw there was basically restating common sense ideas in the terminology of uh, reinforcement theory, which adds nothing except this uh, oversimplifying more complex ideas. And then this background idea that we should have master controllers, uh, super intelligences, namely us, who will somehow manipulate and control people for the common good. That's a very standard idea. Goes back of, uh, to the uh, liberal intellectuals a century ago who developed the concept of manufacturing consent, Walter Lippmann, engineering of consent, uh, Edward Bernays, one of the founders of the public relations industry, and they were very clear and explicit about it. What they said is, people are stupid and ignorant, I'm quoting, population is stupid and ignorant, uh, quote Reinhold Niebuhr, one of them, uh, they are so stupid that we have to control them by necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications, and uh, back to Walter Lippmann, we have to protect ourselves, the responsible men, from the roar and trampling of the bewildered herd. Their job is to be spectators, not participants. We'll run things because we're so smart, and uh, we will uh, control them by various mechanisms. That's wow. the uh, liberal variant of fascism turns out to end up quite the same way. In fact, there's very interesting historical work on this. So if you look at the end of the First World War, when a lot of these things were being developed, if you compare countries like uh, uh, Italy, England, uh, the United States, same kind of ideas were being developed in reaction to the uh, radical democratic thrust that was developing among the population at the end of the war. And what was this, the result was, how can we control this? Well, in Italy, it was done by force. In, in uh, the right. United States and England, it was done by technocracy, by the ideas of a technocratic elite, which will separate itself from the uh, the uh, stupid and ignorant population and control them. But the end results were pretty similar. I frankly don't that, think Skinner contributes no, anything from, to this, from, but there's a, it's a poor, very that. important topic. The, I, I, again, the, the, the jump to that being Skinner, when, uh, I mean, you can talk about manipulating, you can talk about teaching. Um, and if, if you're teaching people about what the contingencies are, that's very different from taking control. But of course, teaching is one way of changing behavior. In fact, if it doesn't work, you haven't, you know, if, if the teaching works, you've changed the student's behavior. 
Um, but the the rhetoric of freedom is 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 important, and um, and in fact, maybe let me try another another direction of this because um, we are now decades past um, some of these other kinds of things, um, and there are some directions of research that well let me let me try them out on you and see that I think might be of some interest. So for example, I've done some research. Um, um, and actually, I began it back before the American Bicentennial. Um, I, had, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how I got into this, but there was a question about whether pigeons had preferences for having choices. And I did a series of experiments in which a pigeon has these two ways of getting into two different kinds of situations. And in one situation, there's just one disc on which the pigeon can peck and it gets a certain amount of food. The other situation, there are two discs on which the pigeons can peck, and whichever one it pecks, it gets a certain amount of food. So they're equivalent in terms of the food the bird earns. And what I discovered was that the birds were much more likely to put themselves in the situation where they had the option. They had the option of which of these two things to pick. Not only that, if you increase the number of choices they had, so you went to three or four, they actually preferred the 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 two over the three, so that uh, this corresponded to what uh, a former student of mine named Barry Schwartz once called overchoice, and how it's a problem in human culture and so forth. I tried to to uh, to publish this at first and and. And a couple more general places because the bicentennial was coming up. I was never successful in doing that. Uh, but there's now uh, there's now there have been several replications of this kind of phenomenon. And in fact, in some applied situations, working with children, when children are when you're trying to work with children and teach them things, giving them a situation where they have options actually provides several advantages over a situation in which there are, there are no options. And this is the kind of thing where um, uh, it's hard because it's to control these kinds of things. So it's hard to identify places where there are practical outcomes. But it seems to me it's useful in a culture like ours to rec- to, to, to know that even the, well, I'll call them the dumb pigeon, and the pigeon is little, literally dumb because the pigeon doesn't speak, has this kind of preference and here's that kind of preference in the house. Um, I, I, is your dog barking in agreement? <laughs> but, um, so, um, and then another of my colleagues, uh, uh, his name is Alan Nuringer, has recently extended uh, some of this to start looking at, at variability. And it turns out that, um, that, uh, with 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 rats he's done uh, and with pigeons he's done experiments showing that um, that you can you can train these creatures um so that um let's say they have a, a, an array of four possible responses and each time they go into this situation they have to press these four levers but the order can be different and what you do is you ask that you will re- you will deliver food for what the animal has done, provided what it has done is different from any of the last three or four sequences. And what you get is is animals that produce this highly variable behavior. And then if you take these animals and put them into free range situations, they are much more likely to explore, much more likely to to get in contact with different kinds of the environment. And, And the direction Alan is going in is to, uh, to show that, um, with with humans too, you can shape up more variable performance. You can get people to do very close simulations of generating random numbers when when some people say humans can't do that. And he's tried to tie this in with our language of volition. So here, out of a behavioral account, you go from what seemed like the stereotyped, you reinforce the behavior, it becomes very stereotyped, it's not variable at all to now studying the sources of variation and uh, and you see that the, our everyday language of volition seems to correspond to, if you look at these animals, 
the words that you use to describe what they're doing seem to be consistent with what we do when we're talking about our own behavior and when we're free. So it seems to me that that a behavioral view need not involve any of these assumptions. Uh, uh, understanding behavior should be uh, um, consistent with the science, but does not, and I, and I, I would suspect that Skinner would have agreed with this, does not imply any particular political system because we don't know enough yet about the behavior and we're only just scratching the surface. Well, I think this what you're describing, which I don't know about, sounds like quite interesting work. I don't know what Skinner would have to say about it. I only know what he did say and what he wrote and what he wrote was at pr proposing a dystopia which is very similar to that of what I just described among the technocratic elite who've devised techniques to control the stupid masses by uh, the proper kind of uh, training and controls. That's what Skinner was doing, fit right into the, the Western version of the fascist regimes, which tried to achieve the same results by manufacture of consent, engineering of consent and control. There could be uh, a, the kind of presentation of, in fact, a good teacher, any good teacher knows that if you want to uh, develop independence of mind, creativity, uh, you put children in situations where they can explore, where they can inquire, where they can create and uh, not without, totally without direction, but with some framework. That's what good teaching is. If that can be made more, uh, more explicit and spelled out more carefully, all to the good, who would care? Seems to be the opposite of what Skinner was interested in, but I don't care about Skinner. We should be looking at <laughs> what should be done properly. Well, okay. I, I, I'm still tempted to go back to Skinner a bit because, after all, I, I'm, I'm identified with him. I, I'm identified with him enough that um, um, I'm kind of curious about uh, um, what what some of the interactions were in in his early days before I even came along to 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 do work there in in that department. And we discussed that a little bit last time. Um, what is it about him? Do you think that these are the kinds of things that have led people to uh, to uh, just sort of be um, the, the reaction to Skinner is often not a dispassionate one. It's often a fairly emotional one. And, and so, for example, I had this experience. Oh, sure. Um, Bicycle? With Rosa. Rosa. I'm going by car with Rosa. You're going out? To the market. What? Market. To the market. To, to the market. market. Okay. Little side distraction. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> well, so I, I, so I'm just curious. Let me, let, me, let me ask you this this kind of question. I, we once at UMBC had a, um, a distinguished linguist visit. I won't name him. Um, he's from the the the. the had come from the West, traveling in this area, and he gave a colloquium. And um, among the things he was interested in was language change and uh, uh, pigeon languages and so forth and so on. And we went out to dinner together afterwards. And there were a bunch of faculty members, including me and another of my colleagues in my department, in the psychology department. And we were having a discussion and we were talking about language evolution and many of the kinds of topics that you and I have been talking about. And at one point in the discussion, the, my other, the other colleague from my department mentioned, oh, by the way, uh, Charlie once worked with B.F. Skinner and was involved in his lab. And this linguist who was who with whom I was having this ongoing, very interesting conversation looked at me and then stopped the conversation and didn't even make eye contact with me for the rest of that dinner. The mere mention of Skinner's name was enough to turn the conversation off. And I'm just wondering, could you say anything about Skinner's 
interactions with other people that might have led to this guy. It's a kind of thing, by the way, I've lived with throughout my career. Um, I've. Uh, well, I mean, I. I knew about all of this in the 1950s and early 60s. After that, I don't have any experience with it. Skinner just kind of disappeared from the discussion. But in the 50s, uh, in Cambridge, where I was, Skinner was just orthodoxy. Everybody worshipped at his feet. Uh, the William James lectures had appeared in 1948. 1949, they were circulated everywhere. It's what later came out as verbal behavior. And they were just dogma. That had answered all the questions about language, uh, cognition, uh, psychology, behavior. Uh, it was most extreme. If you take the case of uh, uh, the most influential intellectual figure in the Cambridge scene was uh, W.V. Quine, philosopher, brilliant philosopher. Yes. To, uh, extreme Skinnerian. Take a look at his book, Word and Object, in 1960. Uh, language is a complex of behaviors uh, <laughs> which are created by uh, operant conditioning. That's it. That's orthodoxy. So it's not that there was any opposition to Skinner. In fact, he was practically God. Uh, there were a couple of us, two or three graduate students, who just didn't believe any of it. Uh, Eric Lenneberg was one, went on to found Biology of Language. Morris Halley was the other old friend. And uh, when I was asked to write a review of the book, I thought this is a good chance to show that the dogmas, actually I had Quine more in mind than I had Skinner when I wrote the book, to tell you the truth. I didn't think Skinner could even hear the objections. He was utterly self-confident, totally arrogant, couldn't hear anything. But I thought others might hear it. And I thought it was a good opportunity to bring into the discussion of these issues two things. First, the behaviorist approach, which was in its most influential form in Skinner, was simply a way of translating ordinary common sense, mentalistic discourse into what looked like scientific discourse. So instead of saying, John wants to read a book, you can say John is reinforced by reading a book. Okay, across the board, that's what it is. I went into detail to try to show that if you take the terms in their technical meaning, everything that's said is false. If you take it in the loose meaning in which it's a rephrasing of mentalistic vocabulary, it's just scientism, making things look as if they're saying something when you're just repeating normal informal discourse. The other thing I wanted to bring in is that there are other studies. There's other work in psychology, which I think, which was unknown, and I thought was much more important like, say, Carl Ashley's uh, Serial Order and Behavior. Very important. Unknown no, in the second. Totally unknown. No, no references to it, except in neuroscience. Uh, European ethology, unknown. Tinberg and Lawrence. And was known to comparative psychologists, but not to the uh, people in Unity of Science, uh, the modern, the the, the Cambridge uh, environment, totally unknown. Uh, there was, I think I mentioned some of George Miller's work, which did undermine a lot of the assumptions, but basically it was unknown. Uh, that was the situation then, and that was the reason for the review. I knew it would have no impact at all on psychologists because they can't hear it. Uh, I thought maybe others, younger people would, and to an extent that did. But Skinner and I personally remained perfectly friendly. We understood each other perfectly. We understood that we cannot discuss these topics. They're fixed. He knew the answers. Doesn't matter what the facts are. So we talked about other things. In fact, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one example, which may surprise you. In... Uh, 
I happened to be at Harvard in uh, 1964, 1965 for the year. I was in the, uh, a, a visitor at the Miller Brunner Cognitive Science Center. So I was at Harvard. Now you recall what was happening that year in the war in Vietnam, which I was very much involved in, was heating up in February. Uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was the uh, national security advisor, uh, advised and they implemented the first bombing of North Vietnam. Bundy was very directly implicated in that. Shortly after that, Bundy was invited to give the commencement address at Harvard in the June commencement. Uh, a couple of graduate students got together and decided to put together a very mild uh, statement saying, we think it would be worth reconsidering whether it's proper to invite as the honored commencement speaker, the person who has just initiated publicly the bombing of another country. That was the statement basically. Well, since I was there, they asked me if I would try to circulate it among the faculty to see if there could be any signers. None. Nobody wanted to sign it. One exception, Skinner. I went to stop by his house, talked for a while, showed him this, asked if he'd want to sign it, said sure. He didn't care one way or another about the war in Vietnam. In fact, he was in favor of it, but he knew it would sort of irritate his colleagues, so he signed it. As soon as any uh, involve, serious involvement in protest against the war began, he was never part of it. He had no interest. But uh, he was an independent-minded person. I liked that aspect of him. Uh, didn't happen to like the background of it, but that was there. Didn't you once serve on a PhD committee with him of a guy, a guy who did a joint degree in philosophy and psychology? I think his name was Carl Schick, um, who would have been probably in the 60s, maybe the 70s. What was his name? Carl Schick. Carl, uh, I, he's, uh, he's, I don't know what, what's, what he, where he's gone since. You better he's, spill uh, it because the transcription is just giving S nonsense. Carl with a K, S-C-H-I-C-K. S-C. Carl Schick. Yeah. My recollection, and I, I met him, is that he had both you and Fred as members of his committee in a joint degree in philosophy and psychology. Probably would have had to be in the early 70s, I'd guess. Um, I just, just curiosity. It seems like an, it seems like it would have been an interesting PhD. Doesn't ring any bells, but could be. Could be. Interesting mm -hmm. I was on a lot I of think, committees. I think, <laughs> I think he wanted to do something that was kind of equivalent to Wittgenstein's Tractatus, but <laughs> you know, that's about all I can say about that, because uh, um, it's been a long while since I've heard about it. I remember it, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, a lot of years ago. <laughs> but, you know, going going on to, to talking about uh, um, the verbal behavior things, and, and you mentioned that you hadn't uh, participated in the in the behavior and brain sciences commentaries. Um, the, the two, it was just two out of those six papers were really about verbal behavior at all. And a third one was about, uh, ethology, by the way. And, and Skinner regarded that as, a as a way of reaching out to the ethologists and, and, uh, and showing that the things could go both ways. But, but the, the two things that were about verbal behavior, neither of them had much to do with what had been in the book. Uh, one of them was what he unfortunately labeled rule governed behavior which I think would be much better verbally governed, which is this, th these kinds of things we talked about with respect to the, if you, if you shape up what someone else says, um, you can change behavior that way. And I think it's important for us to understand that. And the other paper was this old one, um, which was actually, he had published uh, back in the forties, which is called the operational analysis of psychological terms. And I've always, I, I'd be curious about your, your, um, their, his the issues were not so much um uh about uh 
uh, coming up with some kind of a taxonomy of of the kinds of thi- uh, of the the pieces of verbal behavior, but rather he was interested in how we came to talk about ourselves. And I've always found uh, that argument pretty persuasive, in that we can't share words except on the basis of what we share in public. And therefore, if we want to describe our thinking or our feeling or private any kind of private events, the only thing we can go on is the is the public correlates of those events. So if a parent is interacting with a child and both and the parent is looking at this uh, red fire truck or is looking at this uh, um, dollhouse and the child is looking at it too, then we can see how they both have the same public determinant there and so the they both can end up with a common vocabulary but with respect to feelings you know nobody can get inside us and and the the perennial problem and actually this problem goes back to Bertrand Russell and before is you know how, how could we ever learn to talk about toothaches since nobody else can can feel our toothache and despite what the politicians say nobody else can really feel our pain and I wonder if you've ever uh, if that it seems to well, me, I the think there's a paper. Siri, I know that's a that's a very common view. Uh, Wittgenstein, Quine, Skinner, others all accept it. I think it's based on a failure to recognize that the ch- in the simple case, looking at the fire truck, it's true that the parent and the child share an experience. But the concept in the child's mind goes way beyond the shared experience. The child has a rich knowledge of a complicated notion, uh, what's a truck, what's fire, all of that is prior to the experience, and that gives the meaning that we have. Uh, It's true that there's a stimulus which is in common, which triggers the internally structured concept. Uh, These are ideas, again, go back to classical Greece. So take uh, Aristotle's example of, uh, talks about a house. How do we decide whether something, I'm slightly reinterpreting it. He did it in different terms, but let's put it in modern terms. I suppose you point to that thing over there and you tell the child it's a house. Okay, the child sees what you see, but the concept in its mind goes way beyond what it sees. For example, the child knows without experience that if that thing over there looks like a house, but is used to store books, it's not a house, it's a library. If it's used to store horses, it's a stable, even if it looks exactly like a house. It was the, if it, it was intended to be a school, it's a school, not a house. Uh, if you paint the house brown, you're pacing it, painting its exterior, not its interior, though you can paint it brown on the inside. We can go on and on. Child yeah, knows a million numbers, things all, about it, which have nothing to do with the shared experience. And this is true of the simplest words you look at. I mean, suppose you say, uh, uh, tell the child, this thing is a book. Well, what does it mean? What does the child know when it says it's a book? Uh, You can tell the child, this book is, uh, uh, the book which you just read is too heavy to pick up. Notice what the child knows. The book is both abstract and concrete. You could pick it up but you could read it. What you read is abstract. The book is easy to memorize, but hard to pick up. Okay, the child knows that it's both concrete and abstract and nothing in the world is. All of this rich knowledge is in the background and is all elicited by the common stimulation. So when Wittgenstein, Quine, Skinner, everyone else says, well, all you can know about is the common stimulation. They're just missing everything that happens in the simple words. Well, turning and, and back to it, toothache, it takes, it's the same it takes thing. A culture to do that. It, it takes a culture to do it. I mean, 
um, that there's there's a culture in which uh, there's a word that that uh, you mentioned fire and there's fire no culture. The child well, knows nothing about fire the culture and dangerous things. Is is a concept in in some language uh, I've forgotten which one it is, but um, and and you have to be grow up in that culture to have learned that this particular combination of things is 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 discussed with this particular word. So certainly it can't. That's another film. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's got to be some point at which it's public. Now I can certainly grant you that that um, it doesn't even have to be common stimulation i mean uh, a, a sightless person and uh and a seeing person uh could teach each other the names of the geometric solids by one of them touching them and the other one looking at them and they neither of them would be contacting the same stimulus and yet they could come up with a common vocabulary and i guess if if what you're saying then is yes the underlying thing there is that that there is this class of objects and 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 given that these these classes of objects have will will um, uh, will share properties with other objects, and then these names then will be more likely to be extended to others, and and that's the kind of thing you're talking about when you're talking about um, the concept. Not, not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking you, about a I'm talking about a two year old child, two year old child, three year old child doesn't know the culture, doesn't know any of this stuff. The child is shown a truck, a house, a, a book, anything. Immediately, this rich structure of conceptual complexity comes into play because of the child's innate nature. That's a two-year-old or a three-year-old. And we know from experimentation especially Lila Gleitman and her associates, that a child picks up the meaning of the words from two or three presentations, almost no evidence. And this very rich structure comes into play, not the culture, not uh, complex concepts like geometrical objects. In fact, it's even true of geometrical objects. Actually, Descartes pointed this out. One That's of his awesome. points is, so suppose you take a child in infancy, for him, it was a thought experiment. We can now do the experiments. Take a child in infancy who's never seen a triangle or a geometrical object. Present the child with a, a drawing of a triangle. What it will perceive is a distorted triangle, not the actual figure that is stimulating its retina because it has, it interprets geometrical figures in terms of basically Euclidean geometry was just internal structure. Even the most primitive form uh -huh. of perception involves this. All of this is missed completely by the Wittgenstein, Quine, Skinner approach. And once we get that far, when you turn to complex notions like feelings and toothaches, you get the answer. There's an internal structure which is broad and which is shared and which is elicited by the simplest simulations. But when, mm -hmm. until we get the simple cases right, we're going to get all the rest of it wrong. But we need to be able to say something about the sharing, and the sharing involves words, and the words have histories, and we should be able to say more about, about the histories. And the histories are more complicated when there are things that are not... Um, uh, that that are not out there in the environment. After all, a truck is a, is an invented human bit of stuff. I don't see how the a truck could be something that a child innately knows without some experience in an industrial uh, in a world in which uh, uh, the 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 people around have constructed trucks and cars and buses and all of these other kinds of things and in a world which doesn't have those kinds of means of transportation um none of this could be yes no, I, 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 a, but I do I, I do think there's a certain amount saying, of information but it is trivial as compared with what the child constructs as soon as you look at real cases like the ones i've mentioned the structure that the child constructs in its mind goes enormously beyond 
the shared stimulation or the shared history, which is very slight for a two or three year old child. And every word in the language is like this. Well, until you recognize those things, you can't look at the more complex cases. And for those things, it is enormous. So for example, the child knows, well, I could go through more and more examples, but the kind of thing I described goes way beyond the evidence. But let's look and at unless the oh, we're go willing, back to the triangle. Unless um, we're sorry, go ahead. Uh, the the newborn, uh, I mean, there's all these experiments on eye tracking. Will will uh, will track the edges of solids and things, and will will begin to learn that uh, if you keep on moving in this direction, you're off the object and you come back, but that there's where there's a discontinuity, the structure with respect to triangles That's is right. being built up. That's the relevant the kind of experiment. The yeah. And uh, so we have a whole body of literature that I don't see as incompatible with the kinds of things we learn with respect to contingencies later on. Um, the, the contingencies involved with geometric solids are that in a sphere you run your hand over it and you never come up, come up with a sharp edge whereas you run your hand over a pyramid or something like that and you do come to this discontinuity so you're learning interactions between what you're touching uh, and what you're seeing and all of these things are structures that are put together and, and I think they're put together uh, by way of our behaving and interacting with the world it's not, and 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 I think you and I agree on that. It's not nothing of this is passive. There's there's nothing about these kinds of things that that comes is given by the environment. It's given by what the individual does, what the infant does. Um, and as as the infant gets older, there are more and more complex interactions. Um, and many of these are are ones in which doing things like looking here and then looking there have different consequences in what you see and that's what pull, brings this organization together and i i think there's there may not be that much of a distance between what we're talking about maybe part of it is that we're talking about it in a in a, in a different way well the distance is that the when you look at the particular i mean the kind of experiments you mentioned are correct so the child interprets continuity even when there is discontinuity because of internal structure that's the same as basically Descartes' observation about perceiving a triangle, not a distorted figure. There's an internal structure which imposes the concept that the child develops on the basis of limited stimulation. And when you look at particular cases, like the ones I mentioned, you find that the richness of the concept comes almost entirely from the inside. It's barely triggered by bits of stimulation and when you look at it closely you can begin to develop the notions the internal conceptual structure that the child brings to the experience uh, starts from the very beginning uh, why does the child even know that some of the noises it hears are language related uh, a chimpanzee has about the same auditory system just hears noise the ch child automatically, reflexively, picks out pieces of it as language related, then very quickly turns it into uh, structures that are fit into a basic, restricted, determined phonological framework, no other options are available, and does the same thing in conceptual structure. Now the error that's made in the cases of the people you mentioned, starting with Wittgenstein, or to focus, to claim that it's the shared stimulus that gives the meaning. No, it doesn't. The shared stimulus okay. at the very least minimum barely begins to elicit a rich structure of meaning, which is that, there altogether. And when you recognize that, you see that there's no different problem really in the case of feelings. Because the internal That's structure precisely is there. Why I raised the issue of the, the 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 felt and the seen triangle. It's not the shared stimulus necessarily. Um, it, the the stimulus that's available to the person who can only touch the triangle and can't see it is different than the stimulus available to the one who can see it but can't touch it. Um, and and so 
I'm, I guess I guess we're we're coming at this from different directions. Um, I I do think over a long history there have to be, of course, things inside that are going to be organized in certain ways. Um, we touched at this a little bit last time when I was talking about the way the um, uh, the homunculus on the on the cortex then can be organized so that you have the um, uh, correspondences between the fingers and cortical areas with respect to touch. And things of that sort. I can, uh, and well, we're getting very close to the end of our time. Um, but this whole business of how behavior gets organized is is one that um, where I think you could start talking about how some of it has to begin with the environment because the environment dictates where boundaries are. And um, and I don't know that we can begin to talk about it today. But maybe, are are we going to talk again? Are we going to pick up on this, or do you think we okay. <laughs> maybe let's try? Okay, let, let's, I think let's... just to finish, I agree that the environment is there, but the environment barely <laughs> provides any information. Almost all of the structure and complexity is coming from inside the organism, beginning with the first moment when the infant detects that parts of the noise around it are language related. And on from there, but okay. Well, but let's I, try to go on. Okay, so okay, I leave it to our host then to determine yes. um, how and when we can do that. I'd be delighted okay. to. Okay. Yes, we finish this conversation here. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for being with us. It's a complete honor. If you want, uh, yes, we can repeat this another time and do a, a third, pa uh, a yeah. third part. And we contact you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Gracias por ver este vídeo, os dejamos por aquí un enlace a nuestra última formación y por aquí algunos vídeos que os pueden resultar de interés. Si estáis buscando ayuda psicológica también podéis mirar en la descripción del vídeo donde encontraréis nuestra web y podréis solicitar asistencia terapéutica de un profesional confiable y que os ofrecerá ayuda psicológica basada en evidencia científica.